will be on planetary science. Steve Squires will be presenting that. Morning, Steve. Well, good morning, and thank you very much for the chance to appear before this committee. Uh, like the other speakers, I should stress that my opinions are my own and uh, do not re represent the views of the National Research Council or any other organization. Um, I'd like to begin by very briefly reviewing some of the most important questions in planetary science as expressed in the most recent NRC Decadal Survey. These questions are significant because they were derived from scientific first principles without particular regard for the means by which they might be answered. The complete list of questions can be found in the NRC report entitled The New Frontiers in the Solar System, an Integrated Exploration Strategy, and I encourage you to look at that report. I'll just mention a few of the highlights here. Uh, so some of the questions, like, what processes mark the initial stages of planet and satellite formation? What's the history of volatile compounds, especially water, across the solar system? What's the nature of organic matter in the solar system, and how has this matter evolved? Why have the terrestrial planets differed so dramatically from one another in their evolutions? What planetary processes are responsible for generating and sustaining habitable worlds, and where are the habitable zones in this solar system? Does or did life exist beyond the Earth? And there are others. These are big questions, and they span all of planetary science. Now, that decadal survey also described a suite of missions that could address these scientific questions. Again, a complete list of missions is available in the report. Those <coughs> missions include a Kuiper Belt Pluto Explorer. That's a Pluto flyby. It's happening now. South Pole Aiken Basin Sample Return. That's a robotic sample return mission from the moon. Jupiter Polar Orbiter with probes, a Venus in-situ explorer, it's a Venus lander. Comet Surface Sample Return, Europa Geophysical Explorer, Mars Science Laboratory, and more. Now this, of course, is not an exhaustive list of the kind of missions that could be flown in the time period of interest to this committee. But it does illustrate the breadth of techniques that have to be applied to answer the most important scientific questions identified by the NRC. The first point I would like to make is that most of the missions that address important questions in planetary science would not benefit from the presence of human explorers. Planetary flybys, planetary orbiters, <coughs> atmospheric entry probes, landers to environmentally hostile bodies like Venus are all best done robotically, and I believe they will continue to be. However, there's an important subset of planetary exploration that can benefit from human spaceflight, and these are missions to the surfaces of solid bodies whose surface conditions are not too hostile for humans. Now, it's conceivable that in the distant future, humans could explore some planetary surface environments that seem too hostile today, including things like the polar regions of Mercury, moons of the outer planets, comet nuclei, and so forth. But for the time period of greatest interest to this committee, I believe that humans can only realistically explore the surfaces of the moon, Mars, and some asteroids. And I will therefore restrict the remainder of my comments to just those bodies. Now, much has been said about the relative merits of human and robotic space exploration. My own opinion is that both have advantages and disadvantages, and that given sufficient resources, the best approach is one that uses each in the most effective way. My own personal views on this subject were shaped in part by my experiences doing research in ice-covered lakes in the dry valleys of Antarctica. There we used robotic techniques, a remotely operated underwater vehicle, to perform the initial exploration of the lake bottom. The robot provided a safe, effective, and inexpensive way of answering the most basic questions about a very complex and hostile environment. After those questions had been answered, we then used scuba gear to investigate the lake bottom ourselves. The key point is that the first order knowledge that we gained from the robotic exploration allowed us to make expensive and hazardous dive operations, EVAs, if you will, much more scientifically productive than they would have been otherwise. Armed with the knowledge that we had gained from the robots, we had well-defined objectives and plans for each dive that let us tackle the most complicated questions on the lake bottom very quickly and effectively. Now, given enough time, could we have built robots that, would have, that could have done the same jobs that we did in our scuba gear? Yeah, probably. <coughs> but we would have needed many cycles of design, use, and redesign. Humans have an extraordinary ability to function in complex environments, to improvise, and to respond quickly to new discoveries. Robots, in contrast, and this is a key point, do best when the environment is simple and well understood, and the scientific tasks for that robot are well defined in advance. There are also lessons, I think, to be learned from the missions of the Mars rovers Spirit and Opportunity. 
One is that rovers like these accomplish their tasks much more slowly than humans in the same environment would. What spirit and opportunity typically achieve in a day, a human explorer could do in less than a minute. The opportunity rover has traversed about 17 kilometers in its five and a half year lifetime on Mars. This is less than the distance covered by two astronauts in their lunar roving vehicle in a single EVA on Apollo 17. <coughs> the rovers have other limitations as well. Spirit and Opportunity, of course, have exceeded, exceeded our wildest expectations regarding longevity, operational flex flexibility, and science return. But they have also encountered challenges for which they were not designed and that they consequently have been unable to meet. The rovers can't dig deep holes in the regolith. They cannot climb and descend steep slopes. They cannot turn over rocks. They often cannot position their cameras where they're needed most. And they cannot traverse some common forms of loose debris on Mars without getting stuck. All of these limitations have impacted their science returns, and all of them arise from the complexity of their landing sites. Again, given enough time for multiple design and redesign cycles, all of these problems probably could have been solved robotically, and probably could be resolved robotically in the future. But humans in the same environment could adapt to this complexity much more effectively. These experiences raise an important point. Because the capabilities of humans most surpass those of robots in complex environments, the scientific value that humans add is in proportion to the complexity of the environment that's being explored. That's a critical point. So which bodies are complex and which are less so? The moon's an airless body. It's exposed, experienced mostly impacts, volcanism, and modest tectonism over its history. <clears throat> Only impacts have occurred recently. Asteroids are more poorly understood, but are probably broadly similar to the moon in their complexity. Mars, in contrast, is a much more complicated world. It's experienced all the geologic processes that operate on the moon and asteroids, and many more. Wind transport, deposition, water transport and deposition, glacial and paraglacial processes, widespread tectonism, and others. Aqueous alteration and hydrothermal activity have yielded complex mineralogy on Mars that holds clues to past environmental conditions. And there are intriguing clues that Mars once had habitable conditions at its surface and may have habitable niches below the surface even today. All of this complexity means that human explorers can, in principle, contribute more to the scientific exploration of Mars than they can to any other body in the solar system for the foreseeable future. Now, given the strong scientific appeal of Mars, it's reasonable to ask whether or not there is high priority science to be done at the moon. <coughs> Looking at the most recent planetary decadal survey, the answer to that question is an unequivocal and emphatic yes. Several of the most important questions in planetary science deal with understanding how planets form, how they evolve, and why the terrestrial planets are so different from one another. Understanding the moon is central to these questions. That's why the South Pole Aiken Basin sample return featured so prominently in the last decadal survey report. That's why the GRAIL mission was recently selected as part of NASA's discovery program. So there is unquestionably a great deal of important science to be done at the moon. It's my personal opinion, however, that most of the really important lunar science can be done robotically for the reasons that I outlined above. Now let me address four specific questions regarding the role of humans in scientific exploration of the solar system. First, if, rovers, or if human explorers excuse me, are going to be sent to planetary bodies, what's the most cost-effective science that they can do? Second, what important science does sending humans enable? Third, what science can robotic systems do to help enable human exploration? And finally, what can humans and robotic systems accomplish together? Regarding the first question, if NASA is going to take on the substantial costs and risks of sending humans to another planetary body, there are important scientific tasks that those humans can accomplish for relatively little additional cost and risk. Clearly, the best example is sample return. Human explorers are going to have to come back to Earth, and when they do, it will be relatively straightforward for them br to bring samples back with them. Moreover, humans can do a better job than robotic systems of selecting and collecting samples, particularly on a geologically compact, complex body like Mars. Now, let me stress that humans are not required to bring back samples from the moon, asteroids, or Mars. That can be done robotically. But if humans are going to visit these bodies, collecting and returning high-quality samples is one of the most important scientific t uh, <coughs> tasks that they can carry out. Laboratory instruments surpass flight instruments in quality, so the best scientific work will be done with well-documented return samples. And samples can increase in scientific value with time. Some of the best science ever done with the Apollo samples is being done today, using instrumental techniques that did not exist when the samples were collected by scientists who had not been born at the time. 
Next, I'd ask what high-priority science is enabled by the presence of humans, i.e., what simply cannot be done without humans there. The answer may be nothing if we're willing to wait long enough, again, enabling enough cycles of design and redesign of robotic systems. But there are some very important tasks that will require so much equipment and infra infrastructure that it's hard for me to imagine it all working without humans on site to operate and maintain it. Perhaps the best example is deep drilling on Mars. If habitable conditions exist on Mars today, they may be restricted to depths of hundreds of meters or more, where liquid water is stable under current Martian conditions. Deep drilling could be one of the most important scientific tasks carried out on, carried out on Mars, but the equipment required to do it could be very difficult to operate and maintain without <coughs> humans. Robotic precursor missions can do much to enable human exploration, as was shown by Ranger, Surveyor, Lunar Orbiter missions that preceded Apollo. Orbital and landed missions can be used to select landing sites for their safety and for their scientific potential. Precursor landed missions can characterize the environmental conditions on a planet's surface and the threats that they might pose to human health. This could be particularly important on Mars where fine airborne dust is pervasive. Precursor missions can also characterize the environment from an engineering perspective, allowing better design of vehicles, habitats, and suits for humans. And precursor missions can be used to search for potential resources including ice and other water reservoirs on Mars, possible ice at the lunar poles, and materials ranging from hydrocarbons to metals on asteroids. Also, there can be valuable opportunities for humans and robots to work together in exploring planetary surfaces. The most recent space shuttle mission demonstrated this potential with five EVAs conducted in tandem with operations of the robotic arm on the space station, the robotic arm on the shuttle, and the arm on the Japanese Kibo laboratory. So as robotic technology advances, I believe that human explorers on the moon, on asteroids, or Mars will make extensive use of robotic systems just as the astronauts on the shuttle and the space station do today. For example, astronauts in orbit or on the surface of asteroids or Mars will be able to teleoperate rovers without the long time lags and the need for autonomy that's required by teleoperation from Earth. Essentially, all of the science that humans will do on these bodies can be aided by judicious use of robotic systems just as we used robotic systems to amplify the science return from our dives and the drive outs. Finally, I would be ignoring a critical issue if I did not comment on the cost effectiveness of human versus robotic space exploration. I have argued that humans or humans aided by robots can carry out scientific exploration of planetary surfaces, particularly complex ones, more effectively than robots alone. But if good science were the only goal, then I think one of the clear lessons of 50 years of space exploration is that robots alone are more, more cost effective. There are a few examples like deep, deep drilling on Mars of high priority science that may never be practical without humans present, but there's more than enough important planetary science to be done purely robotically, including exploration of the surfaces of the moon, asteroids, and Mars for decades to come. Also, I'm personally wary of arguments that say, in effect, we're going to do this enemy, and we're going to do this anyway, so what science can we add to it? Such arguments have not served NASA well in the past. When science is an afterthought, it can be the first thing to go when schedules slip and when budgets get tight. Now, I do not mean to say that human exploration is bad for planetary science. It need not be, and I believe it should not be. And I am well aware that science is not the only motivation for human exploration of the solar system. Indeed, I am a strong advocate, personally, of human exploration for many other reasons. But if science is to be served well by a program of human exploration, then science must be a full partner in planning and executing that program. And if science is going to be one of the major goals of human, human exploration, not just an add-on, then care should be taken to concentrate the human explorer's efforts in the scientifically complex settings where humans can contribute most. Thank you. Steve, thank you very much. And we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, I'll start out with one then, Steve. Uh, the, the story is told uh, about Jack Schmidt on the moon. Uh, you obviously recognize the story by your reaction. That he uh, found a rock that uh, a robot might not have distinguished from other rocks that were around, and uh, that that particular rock was uh, extremely valuable in terms of our understanding of uh, or our scientific benefits from the mission. And that uh, the moral of the story was that uh, a trained geologist such as Jack uh, could do things that a robot just can't begin to do. Could you comment on that? Yeah, there is no question in my mind that having humans 
especially experienced scientists uh, in the field doing field work on another planetary surface adds value. And I think it will, they will add value on the moon, they'll add value on asteroids, they'll add value on Mars. My point is the more complicated the environment, the more value they add. And if they add some value on the moon, they're going to add even more in a more complex environment like Mars is. Thank you. Please, Jeff. Um, sometimes I get the message lost in the careful euphemisms that we use to explain this. I'm going to see if I'm going to say what I think you mean, and then you can tell me if I'm missing it. Fire away. What you're saying is if we're going to send humans, don't just send them to the boring places because they're easy to land on. That would be one good way of putting it. Yeah, I think a, a, a maybe a slightly more positive spin on that would be concentrate their efforts in the place where they can contribute most. Steve, I'm, I'm actually left with a uh, with few questions that are directly relevant to the science objectives because I think you really addressed what the committee needed to hear or wanted to hear. Um, I would like, though, to ask you to go back to a statement you made at the very end where you said that science is not the uh, the only or primary motive for human spaceflight, and sure. I wonder if you'd share your thoughts with what you think the important motives for human spaceflight are. Oh, well, there are, I mean, there are many, and again, I, I stress that these are my personal views. Uh, Bob Zubrin, earlier today, uh, very passionately uh, expressed some of the other motivations uh, for human spaceflight. Um, there is, uh, I think all of us feel a, a deep human need to explore, to go places where we haven't. It was, I think it was described as a spiritual uh, need, and, and, and that's significant. Um, I will tell you personally, uh, you know, one of the things that I've involved in, been involved in for the last uh, many years now is the, the Mars Exploration Rover, Spirit and Opportunity. And like me, uh, most of the people who built those rovers grew up during the 60s watching Mercury and Apollo and uh, all that stuff on television and dreaming of spent send, sending spaceships to Mars someday. And now we get to do it. And so the inspirational role, the thing that causes young people to go into, uh, into engineering and science and so forth is important. And there are many others. Uh, it's and, not just the science. And do you think those goals are sufficient to justify an $80 billion program over the next decade? If it's $80 billion over a decade, yeah, I personally do. I personally think that those address pressing needs at a national level uh, that justifies that kind of expenditure. $80 million over a decade, that's $8 billion, excuse me, uh, a year. And uh, to me, that, that sounds like a darn good investment. Um, the question is, is that what it really costs? Steve, thank you very much. We appreciate your comments and your candor as always.